arrow here. No está muy bajo. First, where are we going? Okay, so we're going towards 8 billion subscribers. That's everyone in the world will have a mobile phone. Tienes a Claudia ahí. We're going to the traffic in the future. Tienes a Claudia ahí. Sí. Dile que ya regresé de San Arbe. ¿Qué pedo? ¿Qué pedo? ¿Ahora qué pedo? Yo creo que te lo terminé. Yo creo que te lo terminé. That is a lot. That's a lot of traffic. And we're going to something called 50 billion connections, which I will talk about in a minute, what that is. The first way to get there is to make sure that everyone in the world can have a mobile phone. And that's the number one arrow, called mobile voice. So we want to give the ability for everyone in the world to have voice communication with mobile voice. The second arrow, and, and on that one, on the first arrow, we have passed 5 billion users now, and we have 3 billion more to go, and then we're complete. Everyone, everyone can talk. But the second arrow is mobile broadband. So on mobile broadband we have passed 500 million users and in 2015 we believe there will be around three and a half to four billion users on, on uh, mobile broadband. So about 50 percent no me decías que no estaba llegando. No, ya. Ahora sí. Entonces, cuando no te llegue, Now, sí, sí, ya está llegando. Pero eso es que te bajaron de allí. O sea, estaba bien. Te lo bajaron. Sí, es que el problema es que me tardó en llegar allí. Ah, no, eso sí. Pero bueno, pero tú una transmisión la veías con audio. Sí, con audio. Ah, vale. Entonces, pero tú no me estabas diciendo que no iba el audio. No. Entonces, ¿quién me estaba diciendo que no iba el audio? El tercer arrow aquí is even more, even more exciting and even more strange to understand. And that is that the chips that we do, the chips that are going into these, can go into anything. They don't need to go into a handset. The chips can go into cameras, the chips can go into, chips can go into machines, they can go into refrigerators, they can go into home appliances, they can go into the television set, they can go into anything. That's what we call radio in all things. Why this will happen is a lot of the people here are today uh, have just completed university studies or are just coming out of school. And everyone here expects to be connected. You have to be connected. If you're writing a piece of software and it's not connected, it's a worthless piece of software, right? That means that every microprocessor in the world will be connected. And every, every one microsoft processor in the world will be connected. It has to be over a technology like the ones I talked about, which is available everywhere. Radio technology that is available everywhere. That's why we believe and we know that all the things in the world that has a microprocessor in it will eventually be connected. And we have said that maybe that's around 50 billion things. It's just a guess. It's not a scientific number. It's just to put up a very ambitious target for everything that can be connected. Now, let's go back to some of the important trends in the terminal market. And this you all know. It's an amazing development. Over the last years, the graphic displays, the cameras in the phones, uh, the processors, and I don't know how many of you know that, but the machine like this today is much more like a computer than it was a mobile phone before. Today, you separate the processors. There's one processor taking care of the communication. Pero, Second process pero por favor, vayan rápido porque estamos turnándonos y no nos va a dar fotos en el todo. The the operating system on the mobile phone. This development has been triggered very much, I must say, from California. It's very much the Apple iPhone that has stimulated the change in the ecosystem of the handsets. And that's a very interesting development because we had, for many years, we had anticipated that the computer industry and the telecom industry will collide. They, these two ecosystems hay tres, hay allá que no han ido. We could not anticipate how they would collide, but we knew they would collide because phones would become computers, <laughs> and computers would become phones. So when okay, now que... the interesting thing is that the computer ecosystem started in the United States. So 
que Rodrigo si yo, pregúntale Rodrigo ya que se ponga Rodrigo en una cámara en la cámara 2 spreading out of Europe the GSM specification is European from the beginning so much of the much of the mobile phone industry has been a European centric industry from the beginning therefore we have Alcatel we have we have Siemens we have Nokia we have Ericsson we have other companies from Europe that are working on the, on the mobile side of course they were losing the US but still it was a very European centric industry now these industries are colliding And the initiative to build the best handsets in the world has moved back to the U.S., which is very interesting. Where Apple is positioning themselves, and you know, everyone here knows about Google, I think, and Android. Android is a, a handset initiative by Google, which we launched to, to, to battle with Apple. So much of the phone and application industry is now becoming Silicon Valley-centric, U.S.-centric again. There is an enormous interest for this in America. Yesterday, I was in San Jose, California, and gave a speech there because Ericsson has, we have a very big research facility in, in Silicon Valley, where we were talking about all these developments. And everyone from the industry is coming, all the Apple, all the Google, all the people. There's a lot of interest in that, for that there. I think, not, not so much to add here, iPads is a new thing, there will be pads coming, this is just the beginning. All the manufacturers of these kind of devices to read internet, to access internet, to work with internet from mobile devices are developing new ideas and new things all the time as we speak. Um, there are my five total friends, doesn't, doesn't end. Take a look at what's happening in some of the emerging markets. I think this can be a good and interesting example to look at, for instance, from Brazil. Brazil, a couple of years ago, got the 3G licenses. 3G licenses came and mobile broadband started to happen in Brazil. And it has exploded. The same way that it will explode here in Mexico. So you can say today, we are forecasting around 60 million mobile broadband subscribers in 2014 in Brazil. We can also see that the mobile broadband subscribers in Brazil will pass the fixed broadband subscribers That's how quickly <laughs> the broadband is going to me dijeron, ¿por qué no nos enteramos? Y me dijo que porque los cascos son malísimos, porque se cuela mucho audio y que no se nota. Pero, por eso hay que estar muy encima de eso. Por eso les digo, los ojos pegados a esto y a esto. Hay que tenerlos pegados. Si no nos enteramos. ¿Vale? Indonesia, otro mercado donde el mobile broadband ha absolutamente explotado. Hoy, si viajas por Indonesia, The countryside, there are many, many people who is accessing internet, finding out a lot of things through the mobile broadband. The fixed broadband has never reached the countryside, and there's no way it will never do that. It takes just too much time to carry the cable down there. Indonesia is Blackberry's largest market in the world. I don't know how many knew that. Um, it is just tremendous. Blackberry has got to a 10% market share of all mobile handsets in Indonesia because. People are using the blackberries instead of, of PC because it's cheaper. Really. So it's, it's become the de default access to internet over, over blackberry. The main application is actually Facebook in, in Indonesia over blackberry, which is interesting. Most most people in the U.S. who are using blackberry are are, uh, are business people. In Indonesia, the normal blackberry user is a young lady who is 21 years old and wants to check Facebook. Too. Very different. Very different. Something important to remember if you're on the revenue side, if you want to earn money on this, how do you earn money on this? Well, the operators are working a lot with different money ways, ways to make money on this. And mobile broadband is the fastest growing business for all operators in the world. The voice business for the operators is going down. And you've noticed that if you go to a shop today, 
boys, it just gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And then you can buy big packages full of minutes and pay less and less for boys. On the other hand, mobile broadband can be packaged in so many ways. You can buy per time, per usage, what you're looking at, you can prepay it, you can post pay it. So, so there is an explosion in business models around payments coming in on mobile broadband. <coughs> I think that's important to remember. And their innovation around payments, payment ways for mobile broadband is endless. Uh, we can find in Indonesia again, if you go back, you can actually buy a package of six hours of Facebook for a certain amount of money. If you only look at Facebook, certainly, so that, that's what your handset can do. And you buy that, prepaid, in a shop. And people do that. So it's becoming a new consumption behavior of the internet over the mobile over the mobile handset. This graph predicts the exact number of mobile broadband devices that will be out there. And here you can see what I said in the beginning that the PCs, the PCs and the dongles, the, the laptops will be very few. We are here now in 2010. The green and the light green here is the modules. Modules are built in modules. And uh, then we have USB dongles that many of you are using, maybe. Um, and they represent the green. The blue is the handsets. And you can see here in 2015, the absolute majority, more than 90% of all the users will be over the Blackberries, over the iPhones, over the Android phones, over the Samsung devices, etc., etc. HSPA, what is HSPA? High Speed Packet Access is the acronym. HSPA is 3G, so for those who know 3G, then you know HSPA. HSPA is a little bit techy term, but it, it means really that you, you get a high speed downlink and uplink packet access. It's true internet, it's the only internet. HSPA is the fastest growing internet technology in the world today. Which is fun. If you go to Silicon Valley and you tell them that HSPA is the fastest growing in technology for internet, everyone looks at them in surprise. HSPA was not invented in California, but it, it is a fantastic technology in terms of providing speeds. It means that on a handset like this, this happens to be a Sony Eric handset, on a handset like this, I have normally around 5 megabit in the downlink when I travel around in Stockholm or wherever I'm in a 3D network. It's around 5 megabit in the number. You have a 7.2 chip in it. By the end of this year, this one will have a 21 megabit chip in it. 21 megabit chip will give me around 15, 16, 17 megabit in the downlink on my handset. And that is quite a big average downloading speed. And that's before we move to LTE. And I will tell you in a minute what LTE will do. But LTE is just boosting this to the next level. We have passed 500 million users, as I said. We're adding about 50 million new users for HSPA technology per month now, globally. And almost every country in the world has launched HSPA and 3G, and it, it will be launched also here in a bigger scale in, in Mexico. And that means also something else. In all the mobile systems in the world that are out there, all the mobile systems in the world, the traffic from 3G is now bigger than the traffic from 2G. So even though there are only 500 million people compared to 5 billion generating that traffic, they generate more traffic because of the applications. So this is what the iPhone has done for the world. It's generating more traffic than all the voice in the world already. And that happened, that was a big mark actually, that happened in December last year. And you can see this graph here is showing the red is voice and the blue is data. Now, back to the techie. I promise you some, some, some techie stuff here. So this is really the what we call 3GPP family of technologies. The technologies that are coming together. GSM Edge. GSM has been out here since 1992 when the first GSM network was launched in Germany, minus one in the summer. And has spread like wildfire over the world. All the users of GSM. Wideband was launched in Tokyo. In 2002 with Entity Docomo has now 
uh, wideband CDMA or, or 3G technology is available to almost the whole world and 500 million users. The next big step is of course to launch LTE and there are actually a couple of networks already launched on LTE. So I will talk a little bit about them. LTE means long-term evolution. It's a weird name. Some of these technology gets very weird names. The reason it's called LTE actually is because Entity Docomo asked us what should we do for 4G? And 4G is a technology that would be based on uh, another technology that's called OFTMA. And OFTMA technology has been planned for a long time to be used in 4G. And then, on a, as a step on the way, we created the name LTE, Long Term Evolution, which means the evolution into 4G. These are all the operators in the world that so far has signed up to build LTE systems. So in other words, you can say that the success is already here. Everyone that's built the GSM system, everyone that's built the 3G system, GSM is sometimes called 2G, so 2G is built, 3G is built, we'll also build 4G. And that means that in the future you will be able to roam with a 4G phone from country to country all over the world and get the same type of access and use your applications and use your handsets and that will create the scale the scale is necessary to get down the cost. And if we get down the cost, we will be able to bring internet to everyone in the whole world. That's the idea. Now, how does how does LTE work? And this now this is really now we're down to the detail. So it's built on a technology called OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiple axis. In the uplink, we're using single carrier frequency division multiple axis, which is another little bit wider carriers in the uplink and why we're using that in the uplink is because it's difficult to, to generate enough uh, accurate power in the uplink for the base stations to hear the moment. So then we're using a different technology in the uplink than in the downlink. In the downlink then we're using a number of small, small tones and we can generate these tones in any sequence, in any way depending on user, depending on something called the scheduler. Most of you are, are maybe from the IT industry that you know what a scheduler is. So the, the scheduler can generate how much radio resources is brought to one user based on these small, small tones. That's the idea behind OFDMA. We are using very advanced antenna solutions. And most of you are familiar that we have put up base stations all over the place. And what we're doing now is we're using more advanced antenna solutions in order to make this, to be able to have the higher speeds in the downlink. So we're using something called MIMO technology where we're shooting a bunch of bit streams on the same frequency and paralleling them and decoding them and coding them in a way that we can increase the capacity in the downlink. We're using beam forming technology, multi-layer transmission, we talk about diversity. Spectrum flexibility. It's very important because the operators, their biggest asset is the frequency license. And in every country in the world, the operator gets a little bit different frequency licenses. Different spectrum, different wide, and so on. So when we create these technologies, we need to make some sort of technology that can fit into the exact frequency license that that operator has. So that's why with the OFDM, with the, uh, 4G, with LTE, we have created smallest possible bandwidth if, if you're an operator and you get 1.4 megahertz you can actually launch an LTE system on that even though it will have a very limited it will not be able to, to carry so much bandwidth maximum you can launch on is a 20 megahertz carrier now the 20 megahertz carrier if you have a 20 megahertz carrier <coughs> excuse me you will be able to give one user 150 megabit downlink speed 20 megahertz carrier gives one mobile handset the speed of uh, 150 megabit in the downlink. And then if we add more MIMO, we can actually do 300 in the downlink. So that four times four MIMO, with two times two MIMO, we can do we can do 150 megabit in the downlink. So then you can see we can also add more 20 megahertz carriers in the future. And I firmly believe that. As we said before, even television will be using the mobile systems in the future. So that means that we need to be able to carry out television over these, over these uh, uh, transmitters, and then we need higher bandwidth to be able to do that. 
television is around 10 mega, uh, megabit channels today, depending on coding and so on. Um, something we use for this for this streaming session is probably around 2 megabit, but 2 or 3 megabit. But, so it depends on, on what kind of coding screens and the quality necessity. But there are always new advancements in both coding and, and, and quality enhancements. We have launched an LTE system in Stockholm. And this is the first time actually we launched the technology in the city where we do most of the R&D in radio. Um, this is built on around 400 radio base stations in Stockholm, uh, covering most of the inner part of the city. Uh, it was launched in December last year, and the operator here made it extremely expensive because they were first in the world. So they, they, they were charging, they're charging $80 per month to use this. So that they can do that because people, there were queues outside the shops just for people to experience it. And it's pretty cool actually. You can sit, I have it at home, I'm sitting wherever I want in my house or I bring it in the car or whatever. And I always have guaranteed bandwidth of around 100 megabit over this network, which is tremendous in terms of downlinks, but it's really fast. And the latency, the latency is even better than wireless LAN. You have a, a latency on this network which is around 20 milliseconds. And I don't know if I don't know if you're familiar with latencies, but that is extremely good. On a on a GSM phone, the latency on GPRS is always around 500 milliseconds, right? On on 3G, you're around 100 milliseconds. On this, it's about 20 milliseconds. So it's very very fast. This is a this is a map of stock magnets. All of you knew that, but this, this is not correct. And here, here is the driving, it's drive test. We do drive tests every day. We drive around cars here, which has transmitters in them, and we can check the coverage and we can see what the coverage of the of the system is. Telia Sonera was the operator, excuse me, uh, who launched this network, and they, they were extremely proud because it's the first time they have been first in the world uh, with anything, I think. Of course, it's sort of an experiment system for Ericsson as well. Otherwise, the biggest wins that we have, uh, we're building a huge system all over the United States with an operator called Verizon Wireless, which happens to be the U.S. largest operator. They're scheduled to launch uh, LTE at the end of this year. AT&T is, is also decided to, to build a system with us and so on. So LTE is coming. It's coming. And in fact, and this is important for you, many of you here. We have an LT system here in the exhibition, and it's right over there at the other head of this pole. I can see the container over there. If you ask some people there, they'll show you one. So you can see you can see the LT system that is brought here just to demonstrate how does this really look. And it's in there is a radio base station. Might not be that exciting, but it's pretty complicated stuff. One only one of the circuit boards in one of these base stations has the processing power of an equivalent of 150 laptop PCs and it's built on circuits that are, we develop our own circuits, we cannot buy these because there are no, there are no multi-core processing circuits that are powerful enough so we need, need to develop our own. So that shows a little bit how, how complicated it is to build one of these base station things. Right, it's a 20 megahertz carrier in this LTE system that we're using in Stockholm, and it's a 20 megahertz carrier in this one that we have here in the exhibition in, in, in the campus. So where have we gone? Last year when we launched this in Stockholm in December, we launched with around 50 megabit. We launched on a 10 megahertz carrier only. Um, we had 10 megabit in the uplink. Today we have upgraded the system. We did that in May this year to the 150 megabit on the 20 megahertz carrier, as I said. Two by two MIMO using 64 quant technology as the maximum modulation scheme. Um, we are uh, uh, getting around 50 megabit in the uplink, up to 50 megabit in the uplink, which is a very powerful uplink. And I will in a minute tell you why the uplink is very important. In the future, we will be able to upgrade this system to give more than one gigabit in the downlink, which is, which is now the speeds are starting to get very high. One gigabit is, is a lot in the downlink for one mobile handset. I don't know how fast that, but that would be very fast. The reason why we do this is because we know there will be people doing applications that 
will be, I cannot imagine what that application would be, but someone will figure out something that's going to be using all those gigabits. That's why we keep enhancing, keep pushing, keep making sure that we can keep up with the application. Today, I think we are ahead of the application. It will, there's always a balance there. We, in an exhibition very recently, we demonstrated a system that did 1.2 gigabit in the downlink, uh, just to show that it's possible to do that. Then, of course, then you can run a number of, you know, movie-type theater, plasma screen, whatever, in the downlink. No, there is no limit. There's a lot of power in that system. Here is what we use the, the LTE system for in Stockholm. And this picture is from, I don't know if anyone knows it, but we, we had a royal marriage in Sweden, actually. Our crown princess Victoria got married to her prince, Daniel. Um, I don't know if he was a frog before, but now he has become a prince. Everyone in Sweden was very excited about this event. And when they were married in the church, all the people all the press photographer taking pictures wanted to make sure that their picture was the one who reached the television to, to reach the papers first. And they did that by they had LTE, they had their press cameras connected to LTE handsets in the in the in a, in a, in a, that they carried. And then they took a picture and immediately over LTE broadcasted it up. So actually only a few seconds after they kissed in the church, which of course is an important moment, right? That kiss was already in the paper, and the one who won was a, was a one of our media companies that won. They, they, their picture reached, and they came on all the papers. And they get all the money. So that shows that, in terms of media, for instance, it's very important to be fast, and then you cannot. If they had used 3G technology, they would never have been that fast because it takes time to transmit a high-resolution picture of that kind. Now, the other thing we did is even more fantastic. We along the way, when they came out of the church, they were. Uh, riding in a horse carriage through the city and waving. This picture is from the waving. And we had 27 cameras, television cameras like this one, which were broadcasting that over Swedish television. And they were all using LTE in the uplink to get the pictures up to the television stations. So that shows that it works. I must say I was a bit nervous because I was thinking if, if the whole Swedish population was watching and you know, we would have to make a black screen saying, now they're on the horse ride, and we were planning to show this, but we cannot because it didn't really work. But it worked, so we were very happy, and Ericsson was very proud to be able to do this for the royal couple in Sweden. So it shows that this technology has the potential. Finally, I will talk about the, the, the last wave that we had in the arrows. You remember, the last wave was to go to 50 billion devices. So how do we, how do we look at what we have done? This picture is pretty exciting. Telephony was invented by who? Who invented telephony? Alexander Graham Bell. And he did that in 1875. Now, there was a company in Sweden started in 1876. That was Ericsson. So actually at that time, Swedish people must have been different from what they are today because we stole that invention. And we started to build phones in 1876 already. We came out here, we were very early out here in Mexico actually. We were the operator here, I believe, up to the 60s. So we spread this invention all over the world. So Ericsson has built our whole world on that. We, we were, what we were doing practically, we, we, we were connecting places, right? Telephony is about connecting places. Connecting places. So we were working from 1875, 100 years, to connect places. How many places have we connected? How many fixed lines are there in the world? Around a billion. Around a billion places are, are are connected. So this is about a billion billion connected places in, in 100 years. Then we invented mobile telephony. Mobile telephony is not about connecting places. Mobile telephony is about connecting people. Because the mobile device is personal. You would never give this to anyone. I would certainly not give this to my wife because because of reasons that we're not talking about. But, so I think the mobile telephone is extremely personal. So therefore, we have, we have been connecting people, and we've been doing that for around 20 to 30 years, and we have connected 5 billion people in the world for the, for, for the last 20, 30 years. The next step is the green arrow here. 
where digital society and a sustainable world will be driving forces to make sure that every microprocessor in the world can be connected. So by that, we can connect all things, and we can connect 50 billion things. So the next big wave is about connecting things. And why this is important, why this is important for, for uh, this event that you have here in Mexico City, because many of you, many of the people out here will be the ones who are developing applications that will run over everything. Software that will control surveillance systems or uh, environmentally friendly ways of doing things or where microchips will play, play a very, very important role. And all of them will be, have to be connected, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Because everything that you innovate around today has to be connected. <coughs> That's why that will happen. I've made a slide, finally, this is my last slide, just to show to you what those kind of different things might be. Online homes, just think about it. Why would a refrigerator be connected? Because it needs maintenance. Because someone who knows anything about refrigerators can sit in a center somewhere and look at it and say it's consuming too much power or an alarm can go off because the door is open, whatever. I mean, anything that can be done with software. Why would a coffee machine be connected? I, I was in Japan the other day, and I met a, a company that was making coffee machines, one of these new coffee machines. And he said to me, his problem is that this type of machine today is completely software controlled, right? Everything that the machine does is controlled by a microchip. If there is a software error, in his microchip, or he wants to upgrade it, he has to go back to all the sold machines. And you have all read in the papers about recalls, right? Recalls is an important and very expensive thing for industry to do. It's a cheap insurance to make sure that everything is connected and you're able to reload software into anything that you have sold. Therefore, I believe that any home appliance, if anything in your home, will be connected over these networks. Industry, same thing, hospitals, you can imagine. All the hospital machines can be connected. And you can create things that keep that all together. Anyone know what cloud computing is? Cloud computing is where all the software for all the connected things will be. That's why cloud computing will merge with the 50 billion connections. So cloud computing is over-the-top applications that are residing somewhere else being able to communicate with all the connected devices. Smart utilities is driving a greener society, intelligent transport and personal network just around you. As I said, phone, the iPad, all the things you have in your laptop, the storage you have, so on, the devices that are connected to you. You will probably have your own space somewhere in the cloud, keeping track of all your software, all your things, and follow the things that are connected around you. That is our vision, and that's what we're working towards, and we're well on our way. We have given 5 billion phones to the world, we have given 500 million people access to the internet over mobile devices, and we are on our way to give everyone a phone, to give internet to everyone in the world, and be able to connect all the devices around the people. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention, and I hope you share this vision with me. Thank you. All right, thank you. Wow, should I, what should I do with it? It's an Ericsson thing, isn't it? Should I wear it? Okay, maybe this off. <laughs> ah. this, uh, see, I'm connected here. Muchísimas gracias, Su. Thank you very much. Thank you. Por favor, un fuerte aplauso para ambos. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And good luck here in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you.